Um, there was the, the success of Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, and now just recently uh, another book called Reality is Not What It Seems, The Quest for Quantum Gravity, has also been translated to Norwegian. Um, these books are up for sale down here, and Professor Rovelli has agreed to also sign copies of these books after the lecture, so there will be a possibility for that. Personally, my personal encounter with, with the writing of Rovelli, uh, of course, I find, as a physicist, I find it fascinating, the, the vivid descriptions of, of the various technical aspects of physics in his writing, but in addition to this, what I find most pleasing and satisfying reading Rovelli is actually the broader concept of science that he presents. Because in Rovelli's writing, what I find is not a view of science that is cold and narrow and technical and something that only happens at blackboards and in laboratories. It's a more lively view of science, uh, of a science that is constantly in interaction with philosophy, with literature, and with art. And this is a view of science that I feel passionate about and that, for me, helps me motivate me on those days where you're not able to solve any equations and all your computer code crashes. <laughs> so I'm looking very much forward to this lecture, and please join me in welcoming Professor Carlo Rovelli. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction. Those days in which you cannot solve the equations and nothing works are the large majority of days of a, of a scientist, <laughs> as, as you know very well. Um, I, I thank you for all being here, so numerous. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be in a sausages and potato salad uh, <laughs> meeting. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's great being here in Norway. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, quantum gravity, sort of the, the, the major uh, topic of my research for, for my life. Uh, this is not at all a technical uh, uh, um, lecture um, with equations. I don't assume uh, you know uh, much about loop quantum gravity, uh, uh, nor about uh, uh, theoretical physics, even if I know that uh, uh, in the audience there are various people who actually are expert. Um, I, I want to I uh, talk uh, about quantum gravity, but um, of the aspect which I find more interesting in quantum gravity, um, which is the following. Let me start in, uh, from this. Uh, science, we all know, um, it's based on observations, right? So we make measurement, we do observation, and with this we build theories. Um, now, we know that the, the relation between theories and uh, observations is a little bit more complicated than that because theories themselves uh, needed to make sense of observations, so it's a back and forth. Uh, so here is a simple picture about science. The, the, the scientist is a, is, is a rational being uh, who uh, has observation, build theories, and go back and forth between that. Well, sort of, because uh, the scientist has in his mind uh, language, prejudices, concept, uh, 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 ideas about the world, uh, which form uh, the general conceptual structure we use to make sense of the world. And uh, this is very much part of the game. And this is a point where I'm coming. As time goes ahead, we have more precise uh, observations. So observation increase. Uh, theories evolve. But uh, the conceptual structure evolves as well. And uh, scientists and, and humanities together uh, change mind about the, the proper conceptual structure to understand the world. So we change what we mean by space, time, reality, observation, and so on and so forth. And this happens in, in big moments, like the Copernican Revolution, for instance, right? When suddenly to be still means something, something else, right? Are we moving? Uh, no, we're not. We're still, but yes, we are because the Earth is moving. Uh, it happened, I don't know, when Darwin discovered that we are cousins to all plants and animals, we have common ancestors. So we reorient, re, 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 re uh, restructure a way of thinking. But it keeps happening in, in science all the time. And in fact, um, 
those of us who are involved in, uh, in research know very well that mostly uh, when you have a student in uh, come for a PhD thesis, you give her or him a problem, and then most of the time it's not solved because the problem was wrongly formulated, so you do some, something else. So science is not about well-posed problems to be solved. Uh, it's about changing your mind about what the problems were, so on awesome and so forth. And that's, for me, the most interesting aspect of science. Um, it's a continuous rewriting of... Uh, uh, the, the basic way we think about the world. And that's what I want to talk about in the course of quantum gravity. Now, during the last century, uh, during the 20th century, this change of uh, concept happened very strongly with the two big revolutions in, in, in physics, general relativity and, and, uh, and quantum theory. After general relativity, we think about space, time, causality in a different manner than before. And after quantum theory, we think about what is matter and what is actually there, the stuff of the world, different than before. Um, this side is more consensus, what exactly we have understood. This side, people are still debating what exactly quantum mechanics has, is telling us about the world. But in any case, certainly, everybody agrees that both uh, this theory have changed our basic ideas about the world. Um, the problem is open in bringing them together and having a quantum theory of gravity. In doing so, one has to go further and to further modify the notion of space, time, matter, observation, and, and so on. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So I will say something about specifically the theory of quantum gravity in which I'm working, loop quantum gravity, uh, in the course of the discussion, but I don't want to give you a lecture about loop quantum gravity. I want to tell you what fascinates me in this story and is how we change our mind about these basic concepts, which is to some extent uh, an ensemble of ideas in which <clears throat> everybody agrees that we have to change uh, the way we, we think about these things. And I'm going to focus on uh, uh, f uh, four or uh, four plus one topics. One is uh, uh, space, how the notion of space has changed and is changing both. Uh, the second is time, which is most uh, mysterious of all, probably, and uh, the most fascinating of all. Um, the third is what is the basic stuff of the world, what is the world made of. And uh, then if there is time, I'm not sure there is time because uh, it might take more than I, uh, I plan. Uh, I will talk in which sense uh, uh, we are increasingly describing the world more in terms of relations than in terms of things. So these are the four topics I want to cover, and then at the end, very rapidly, I want to uh, tell you that this is not just blah, blah, blah of a philosopher. It's actually meant to uh, tell us an actual description uh, of the world where we can make predictions about what happened to stuff and compare it with experiments. So what kind of predictions? Uh, one is doing. So let me directly go to space. <coughs> Number one. So what is space? That's the question. How did we think about space? How we changed our mind about space? How we probably still have to think, um, change our mind about space? Um, well, there are two ways traditionally of thinking about space. Uh, this one and this one. Uh, this is the one we study at school. Space is just a sort of empty set of positions, uh, which has a geometry, the Euclidean geometry, where things move. And that's Newton's way of thinking about space, um, which is uh, familiar to many of us, mostly because we studied at school or because it's become common knowledge, but it's not the traditional way of, think of thinking about space. The traditional way of thinking about space uh, is that there's a number of things, um, me, the air, the table, and these touch one another, and space is, who, is where I am with respect to other things. So space is the answer to the question, where am I? I'm in Oslo, so it's a, it locates me with respect to something else. And this location of things with respect to one another is the way um, space has been seen in the past uh, and made it precisely by uh, philosophers and physicists all the way from Aristotle to Descartes. Um, Newton, when he came out with this uh, vision of space, which is different, uh, it encountered difficult. Well, <coughs> let me put it this way. 
one way of viewing this division, uh, it's, uh, it's less deep than it what looks like. It's, it, it, they're both, they're both uh, instinctive to us uh, because of a very accidental fact of the world where we live in, which is air. Air is very thin. So sometimes we talk about air as if it was something existing, sometimes we forget about air. So uh, we say, what is there between you and me? Nothing. Okay? Or what is there between you and me? Air. Okay? So essentially these two people, Aristotle and Newton, just made a lot of philosophy about these two ways of thinking about the world. Uh, Aristotle, who is precise, doesn't want to say that between you and me there is nothing because there is air. Newton, who is more interested in application and how things move, and air doesn't matter much, uh, just want to think about the object, how, 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 how they move. But the fact remains that what's the best way of thinking about space? If we take away things, what remains is empty space or nothing at all because space is just a relation between, uh, um, between things. Well, it actually turned out that uh, uh, these two profoundly different ways of thinking space and this great innovation of Newton are not so different after all, thanks to two steps. The first is uh, uh, Faraday Max introduction of fields. So in Faraday Maxwell theory in electromagnetism uh, is not just space with particles or space with objects, but is fields and fields are everywhere. And the second step, Einstein key idea that Newtonian space, space, this empty thing that remains when you take away stuff, is just one of these fields, is the gravitational field. So Einstein sort of uh, says they're both right, Aristotle and Newton. Newton is right to say that b beyond the things we see, there is something else, which sort of structure the spatial relations. But he's wrong in saying that that's something fixed, uh, uh, immutable, independent of something else. Uh, it's just one of the ingredients of the world. So the picture of Einstein <coughs> that works, and works so spectacularly well, is that space is actually one of the fields of the world, the electromagnetic fields, which, like the electromagnetic field, can wave, can bend, can stretch, can, can move. There's dynamical equations. And... Uh, what is it? A week, two weeks ago, there was a Nobel Prize given to the uh, guys that uh, uh, led the measurement of the gravitational waves, which are actually the, the, the waving of space. So Newtonian space is not a, is not a Euclidean geometry, it's something that can actually uh, uh, have ripples like a lake, and uh, they were detected, and that's the detection of uh, gravitational uh, waves. So the space in which we immerse is a thing, thing like the others, uh, which can bend, can, uh, can, uh, can wave, and can bend all the way to make black holes. This is an intuitive picture of a black hole. A wave, uh, the space itself makes a sort of hole. It's a real picture of a black hole. This is a picture of a gravitational waves. This is LIGO, uh, the, the machine to detect them. Now, uh, so far, so good. <coughs> this is uh, uh, 20th century physics. This is old physics. Right, so it's 100 years ago, Nobel Prize is given, it's largely uh, uh, established. But there's quantum mechanics. That's half of the story. The other half of the story is quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics tell us something very simple, which fields themselves, like the electromagnetic fields, have a granular structure. Feel the light is made by photons. Uh, so, quantum theory tells us that fields are granular. They are made by quanta in a technical way, but it's also in a very intuitive way. I mean, if light falls on a screen and you look slowly what's happening, on the screen there are dots that are uh, uh, hit one by one. And if the screen is a photographic screen, the lights are falling in it. If it is slow enough and you look what exactly what is happening, it's like raining, many little uh, pieces. So it does make sense to think electromagnetic waves as, a, uh, as an ensemble of, uh, of, uh, of photons. Now, look what happens if I bring the two ideas together. And that's the core of quantum gravity. Uh, that's 
Newtonian space, that electromagnetic field, some wave on, undulating over it. If I look in the small, taking a quantum mechanics, is photons. Space-time is itself a field, can make waves. If I look in the small, space-time itself should have a granular structure. So the first thing that loop quantum gravity is, uh, is a mathematical theory of the description of these grains of space which are not in space, they are space themselves. They are this, the, 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 the micro microscopic components out of which space is made. Which means that if I take uh, this amount of space, I can divide in two, I can divide in two, I can divide in two, in two, in two, but at some point I have to stop. There's a minimal uh, volume. There's no, nothing smaller than that. That's not a strange idea in physics, right? I mean, atomic physics has discovered the same thing, or statistic mechanics is based on this idea. There is some granularity in the small. And quantum mechanics is to a large extent the discovery of, it's not only that, but it's to a large extent the discovery of this granularity. Technically, if you go on phase space of a system, you cannot zoom more than a, one uh, volume of phase space with the dimension of the Planck constant. So that's quantum mechanics. So this quantum space is what are described by <coughs> quantum gravity, by loop quantum gravity. There is some mathematics. Uh, they, they, the characteristic is that each one of these is a quantum space, is that in the descri mathematical description, uh, they know who is next to whom. That's what makes their space-like, spatial, spatial character appear. So uh, quantum states are described by these graphs with quantum numbers, and quantum numbers are related to the, uh, to the geometry, uh, the fuzzy quantum geometry of the individual, uh, individual quantum on, on space. These are called spin networks. And uh, one can think of this line as a sort of the, uh, the, the individual Faraday lines uh, of the gravitational field which become uh, um, uh, discrete in, in quantum mechanics. So these are the main equations of loop quantum gravity. I'm not going to des describe them, but I want to show them just to say that I'm not talking empty words. There are some equations behind. I, I, I used to say that I don't believe any theory if it is not simple enough that you can write it on a t-shirt. So I put it on a t-shirt. And uh, uh, I, <laughs> the, um, the first two equations actually describe the, the Hild space, the space of these uh, uh, spin networks, uh, and the interpret geometric interpretation which is given by some operators on, on that. So what does this mean? It means that uh, there is no arbitrary smallness, there is a finiteness in the small. For instance, the area, if I take a piece of paper here, the area of this piece of paper, a certain number of centimeters uh, square, uh, 20 times 10, I don't know, 200 centimeters square, is actually how many individual lines of the graph uh, are uh, cut through. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a certain number of... Uh, of course, there, there, there are many, right? Because the, the, the structure we are, we are, we are talking is, is, is at the Planck scale. So in a centimeter square, there are 10 to the 66, which is a huge number of uh, uh, grain. That's what I wanted to say about space. Granular, material, like photons, not a stage on which things happen, but a, a, a granular part of the set of things. Let me talk about time. Uh, again, I go back to classical general relativity and its uh, surprises. Uh, for the people here who know general relativity, this is uh, very old stuff and very boring, but for the people who are not in science, this is always uh, surprising. Uh, what general relativity tells us is that time passes uh, 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 faster uh, at sea level, uh, sorry, uh, in the mountain and slower at sea level. So if you take two uh, uh, twins with the same age and you send one up in the mountain, uh, you, 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 you wait for some time, uh, you wait, wait, they do whatever they want to do, and after a while, the one in the mountain is much older than the one down. So when they meet again, uh, this guy has lived a long time, this guy has lived uh, uh, less time. Now, this is just the fact of the world. It can be checked. Of course, it's a small effect, 
Um, in my generativity classes, this is a typical problem, first problem in the exam, compute how, what's the difference for two uh, twins that spent 80 years, one uh, in up and one down, uh, at 1,000, 2,000 meters of altitude, and the answer is uh, a few milliseconds. So, not much. And so we don't see the millisecond difference in the aging of people. But today we have very good clocks and we, this can be measured and it's just a fact. And in fact, we have so good clocks that can be measured a few centimeters of altitude. We have clocks good enough that you put one on the floor, one on the table, look back, and uh, the one on the floor is late with respect to the one uh, uh, on the table. Now, this is actually and I love this, and my physicist colleagues often get surprised before uh, when I tell the story, but, it's, uh, but then they say, yes, of course, it's like that. Um, this is the reason things fall. Okay, why this d does that? Why if I throw this, it goes up and then comes down? Well, um, so this is a, two girls sending a ball to one another, which has this nice trajectory. I, I should draw it in space-time, but it gives the idea. Now, if you take a plane from Oslo to New York, the pilot, uh, it's dead. the pilot doesn't go straight, go up and down, goes up and down. Now, why is the pilot so crazy to do that? Oh, it doesn't matter, I don't, I don't need it, it's, it's okay. Um, why the pilot does that? Well, because the dark line, well, of course, because the world is, is round, right? So this is actually the shortest path. It's a representation which is wrong. The shortest path from Oslo to, to New York is not to stay on the same parallels, go up and down. Or if you want, if you go up, the distance between east and west, between parallel, is different than down. Or in technical words, we are looking for a straight line on a curved surface, a, a geodesic in a curved uh, a surface. Now that's exactly a geodesic in a curved surface, space-time, because the geometry of space-time is not Euclidean. Up there, time goes faster than down here. Therefore, it's convenient for the ball, if it won't to go to some point at some instant, to another point at another instance, it's convenient to go. That's the extremal uh, line. It's exactly the same mathematics. So the reason we are attached to the ground is because time goes faster our head and our feet. That's what keeps us down. Um, uh, now, when we have a grain of space and evolve, um, the, the change in time is given uh, by some uh, network going to another network and so on, which can be is described in the series to some mathematics, which is called spin form. Uh, which you can imagine uh, as uh, originated by the continuous movement of one going to the other. It's just a way of representing it. It's a sort of Feynman diagram. Instead of Feynman diagram of particles moving in space, it's a Feynman diagram of, diagram of space itself uh, evolving. And it's called spin forma because uh, it does a sort of formy structure. What it's supposed to describe is the creation and destruction of quantum space like that. Now, well, some mathematics. And there's the last equation, but in the last equation, describe this, there's no time variable. That's where I wanted to get to. There's no t in the last equation. And in fact, this is not just loop quantum gravity. Since the 60s, the first equation of quantum gravity, William and the Week, were writ written down, uh, the variable t disappears. And the variable t time is in all equations of physics from Galileo falling bodies, in fact, from uh, Aristotelian, uh, uh, Alexandrian uh, astronomy, uh, all the way through Newton, Maxwell, Einstein, okay? There's always T, how things change in time. So how is it possible that in this last equation that gives evolution in time, there's no time? When William DeWitt wrote the equation in the 60s, everybody was confused. Why in quantum gravity, there's no time variable anymore? And uh, there were, you know, papers, uh, discussions, conference, all sorts of things. I think that now things are much clearer. And in fact, our, the answer is very simple. And here's the answer. Uh, we, we, we measure time with clocks, uh, watches, stuff. I mean, almost every watch has a, 
has a pendulum inside, something that oscillates, electronic or mechanical. Now, the guy who uh, first noticed that uh, the oscillation of a pendulum do not depend on the amplitude is Galileo. And the story goes that he was in the uh, church in Pisa, in the cathedral of Pisa, and there was this huge uh, chandelier that was sort of slowly oscillating. And uh, it was during a religious function, and he was obviously not very taken by the religious function, and was looking at this oscillating things, and was counting how many pulses of his, his heart took for each oscillation, and realized that, that the oscillation would become smaller and smaller and smaller, but always the same number of pulses. If it was me, I would get excited, so my pulses would go faster, and I would <laughs> mess up everything. But here it was cold blood, and uh, it's not real Italian, and, uh, and, and so it worked. So uh, then he said, ah, the oscillation of the um, pulse, uh, sorry, the oscillation of the chandelier take all the same time. But what the hell does it mean? Because sometimes later, today, doctors measure the pulse of patients using clocks, which is a pendulum. So, uh, pulse have the same time in clocks, which is the same time. So, are we all measuring time in terms of Galileo and pulse? Uh, Galileo? It's, it's, it seems to be something circular here. And in fact, it is something circular. And uh, the guy who makes it completely clear is Newton. Newton, in his first book, makes it completely clear. Newton says, look, I introduced a time variable t in my equations, but that time variable is invisible. It's not what I measure. Because I always measure things that change in time. The, the position of the handle, the number of pulses of my uh, hurt, the number of oscillation of the pendulum. So these are uh, variables, A, B, and I, I only see the A, B. I describe them evolving in T, but that's a mathematical description. I actually measure as A changes with respect to B, and B changes with respect to A. Newton says that variable T is not something directly observable, Clocks are just what something that tries to approximate it. The variable t represents a, a, an intellectual construction to put order in, in the events of the worlds. But this means, of course, that it is possible to describe the world without time. You just have to describe, use uh, a as a function of b, b as a function of a, instead of all as a function of t. And in other words, you can directly describe how physical variables change with respect to one another rather than describing how they change in an invisible um, quantity. And this is possible always. Um, it is required when you do to quantum gravity because in the very small, uh, the happening, the individual happening of the world are not organized anymore in a unique rhythm going together. So you can only describe how things change with respect to one another, and that's exactly what the equation of quantum gravity uh, say. So the last equation describes the change in the quantum space uh, not as it happens in time, but as it happens one piece with respect to the other one. And that's what we learned from general relativity. Which one is the true time? The clock on the table or the clock on the floor? The time of the guy in the mountains or the guy down? Neither. We have many things that changes, and the equation of phys physics should tell us how they change one with respect to other, the other. There's no preferred time in quantum gravity. That's the big message of quantum gravity with respect to time. At the fundamental level, forget time. Just describe how uh, things change one with respect to the other. And the time of our experience, well, that's a problem of our experience. It's something to be understood, but later, not in the fundamental theory of the world. How am I doing with time? Well, oh, <coughs> uh, good. So just one slide about the ingredient of the world. I want to do it fast, but uh, uh, step by step. So Aristotle, uh, it's probably misspelled in English. I don't know if it is visible. Um, talked about the substance of the world uh, as some basic stuff on which um, everything was built. I mean, I don't want to go into it all. Uh, but at the beginning of modern science, Descartes had a similar idea. There was a uh, matter, which he called res thing, res extensa, has a proper 
a property of extension by itself, remember, it's not in space yet, uh, that was building everything. And Newton uh, introduces this time and space as uh, crucial for describing the world, so time and space and bodies, today we would say particle. Uh, Faraday and Maxwell are at the fields, so many of you studied physics at school at this level. So it's space, time, and in space time, there's electromagnetic field all over and particles moving around. Um, then come Einstein in 1905 with special relativity and tell us that space and time are very much mixed in what we call together space-time. And 10 years later, Einstein does general relativity, which is the, the, disco the discovery I described at the beginning, which is space-time is just a field. So now space, time, and fields become the same thing. And we don't have any more space, time, fields, and particles. We have just fields and particles. And that's the world in uh, uh, classical generativity. Quantum mechanics, by itself, uh, is a discovery that fields, the electromagnetic field, has a particle aspect, the photons, the grains, and vice versa. The grains have a field aspect. So there's not just fields and particles, but that quantum fields. Now we're going to do quantum gravity, and quantum gravity means taking these two steps together. So in quantum gravity, we go back to a single uh, entity to describe the world, uh, which is uh, quantum fields, covariant, I mean, because they don't live in space-time, they just live on themselves. So space, time, particle, classical fields are all emergent properties of the same whatever, which is these quantum fields. Oh, I'm doing bad with time, so I'll be, thank you. I'll be pretty fast about the last thing um, I want to talk about, which is relations, which is also conceptually harder, then I'll take some questions if you want to go deeper into that. Uh, but I'll go faster through this because I want to say about something about predictions uh, at the end. So why I said relations? Because... Um, if I said in the previous slide that the stuff of the world is quantum fields, what exactly are quantum fields is far from obvious because they're quantum, at the light of quantum mechanics. So let me give you the key insight into quantum mechanics, besides granularity, which is due to um, Heisenberg, who is the true inventor of quantum mechanics, what we call together quantum mechanics, before Schrodinger, in a much more general way than Schrodinger. And uh, uh, there is a story uh, that he tells in one of the plays written about him, which is very beautiful about the beginning of quantum mechanics, which is significant is the following. He was in the Copenhagen uh, in the 20s, this is 24, 25, and uh, uh, discussing with Bohr all the time what this means, this quanta, what, this, what, what is all that. And he was walking in the evening alone in the park, behind the Copenhagen Institute, and it's very dark in the 20s. There's so just some lamps, and he sees a guy walking under a lamp. Actually, he sees it appearing, and then, whoop, it's not there anymore. And then he appears again, ah, it's there, and then it's not there anymore, then it appears again, then it's not there anymore, then it appears again. And then he thinks, um, well, I mean, this is a guy, he's big and heavy, uh, so I know that it's not disappearing between one appearance and the next one, I know he's just walking in the dark, I'm not seeing him. And then he has this flash of light, says, wait a moment, that's true for the guy who is big and heavy, but what about an electron? How do I know an electron actually is there between two effects? Couldn't an electron be just a discrete sequence of interactions? And making an effort to reconstruct a trajectory between the two being wrong, being applying to small things, whatever is good for the big things. And that, uh, I believe, is the crucial uh, realization of um, Heisenberg, and is a real core of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics allows us to compute what happens in interactions and dramatically refuses, us, refuses to tell us what happened in between. If we think that we know what happened in between by writing a wave function or things like that, then funny things happen. Either wave function, boom, mysteriously jumps when we look, or it opens up an infinite uh, many worlds, which I don't know how people can be so crazy to believe in them. 
or, or whatever. I mean, strange things happen um, if we try to fill up the individual interactions. I think that the message of quantum mechanics is that is all there is. The instantaneous discrete pieces of interactions, except uh, that's not cheap again, because uh, if a quantum system is interacting with another system, something happens, but if the two systems together are not interacting with a third system, a third observer, then the happening is true for all, but not with respect to all prime. So that's a conclusion. Quantum theory does not describe things. It describes how systems affect one another, and it doesn't give us a coherent overall picture of what happens. How much time I have? Zero? Five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Good. So, space is not what we think it was. Time is not what we think it was. Uh, the thing, stuff of the world is not what we thought it was. Uh, observation is not what we thought it was. What do we do with all that? I mean, do we just write books of philosophy? Well, actually, no. We can try to answer questions like what happens things falling into a black hole. Generativity tells us that the black holes are there and we saw them, that things fall inside, go past the horizon, go to the center, get to the center, and then, we don't know. Generativity says, boom, boom, I don't understand anything anymore. If you put in the equation, everything becomes infinite, just the theory makes no sense whatsoever. Now, in quantum gravity, using loop quantum gravity, you're actually, you can actually try to compute what happens, and what happens is that inside the black hole, there is a quantum region, where space is not defined, time is not defined, everything is fuzzy, but it's, uh, it's sort of quantum tunneling into a white hole. So things just come in and bounces, uh, bounces out. And uh, so the idea is that the black holes form and uh, uh, there is some intermediate uh, transition, which we call um, Planck star. And uh, in the same region of space, then it becomes a white hole. Now, this process is very fast, but remember the guys, time goes a different time. Um, it is a certain time if you're inside, and there's a different time if you're outside. And remember that outside is like being in a mountain, it's more far away from the thing. So there's more time here, but not just a little bit, like between uh, Oslo and, and, and the Alps. A lot, because there's a huge amount of gravitational field, if you want, in the black hole, enormous. So one can put cal numbers then and calculate what happened for a star. The bounce takes a milliseconds inside, outside. If you do the little calculation, it turns out it takes 10 billion years. That's the difference. So this opens a possibility that there are black holes at the beginning of the universe. This is expanding universe. We are there the large universe. This is a very early universe. The very early universe was very hot. And uh, it's astrophysicists, the cosmologists, uh, suspect that black holes could have been formed there because of the um, random thermal agitation of things. So if a black hole formed there, uh, a millisecond later explodes, but actually for the external world, uh, 10 billion years have passed, uh, which is now, we humans have developed in the meanwhile, so we have also built telescopes, and we might see the explosion of the black hole. And uh, we are trying to compute what exactly would see, what would be the properties, and uh, we have some suspicion that some signals which are being observed could be that. There's nothing certain, there is nothing uh, already established, otherwise you would have it read on newspaper titles. Uh, but it's to tell you that uh, the hope of the theory is to get to the point in which you make prediction. I mean, look at those signals, they have these properties, uh, and get a testing of the, of the theory. So here we are. I conclude, uh, and I think I am in time. Uh, there is a deeply novel worldview that emerges from quantum gravity. <clears throat> and let me be clear, the theory is not tested yet. But the consensus that all these notions have to be modified uh, is there among loop, people in loop quantum gravity, people in string theory, people in other approaches to quantum gravity. The concrete way, the concrete equations which are being written down are different, and there's a lot of 
fighting, which is good science, we have to debate, um, but that there is this uh, need for reshaping the basic concepts, con concept, uh, there's large consensus. So summarizing, first of all, in the small uh, space is discrete, more precisely space is a gravitational field, which is made by little uh, chunks, little fuzzy small uh, grain of space, atoms of space. Second, there is no time variable in the fundamental equation of the world. Time is a more complicated concept that come up layer by layer in, 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 in approximations along the road. Um, the ingredients of the world do not include space, do not include time, do not include classical fields, do not include particle, include uh, quantum fields, which have, of which we have a mathematical uh, description, of which uh, uh, we, which allows us to see, uh, talk about how one piece of the world interacts with another piece of the world. So this is deeply relational structure at the core of, uh, uh, of modern physics. Uh, one tentative um, direction, uh, others is not the only one, to study for possible prediction is to study what happened to black holes on the long, uh, uh, on the long range. So this is the um, strange uh, uh, world, uh, the unusual worlds uh, that uh, emerge from uh, quantum gravity and uh, Susan Tuck. So thank you uh, for a very, very nice talk. Uh, we will now open up for some questions. I'm sure uh, some of you have questions. Uh, if you do, please wait until you get the microphone so that everyone can hear and we get the sound uh, on the stream as well. So any questions? There's one down there. <laughs> okay, so with the uh, exploding white holes, what happens then to Hawking radiation? Does it come all at once in this explosion or what? Um, very good. Uh, yeah, this is <coughs> this is exactly one of the things on which we uh, we are much working. There is much um, debate on the details. So uh, essentially, we are talking about two different phenomena. Hawking radiation is a, a slow leaking out of energy from a, from a black hole. It's also a quantum phenomenon, but it's not a quantum gravity phenomenon. It's quantum fields and the classical uh, back reaction on generativity. In fact, if you if you read the ni ni uh, 64, 74 uh, original paper by Hawking, it says very clearly, um, I disregard quantum gravity phenomena, which might change the picture. So how uh, the, the story I give you is, is uh, forget Hawking radiation, that's what's going to happen. Now, if I bring Hawking radiation in, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to happen that a black hole would slowly uh, Hawking radiate, so it becomes smaller, and the smaller it is become, uh, the more probable the, the tunneling happen. So at some point it's going to happen, and when it happens, it transforms into a white hole, and then whatever is inside can come out. So the effect of the Hawking radiation is to make this transition faster than what it would happen without it. Without it, it might take longer, but since uh, the probability depends on the size, uh, Hawking radiation makes it smaller, and therefore it makes it more increasingly more probable, and so it makes it happen faster. And uh, in, in the standard Hawking radiation picture, in the standard discussion, when, 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 when we didn't know about that, the question was always, well, Hawking radiation makes the hole become smaller, 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 and then what? And nobody knew. Now we have a picture of what could happen at the end of the Hawking Revolution. Very good. Are there more questions? Yeah, one at the far back. Uh, I know dark energy isn't confirmed in any way, but 
Um, if dark energy makes the universe expand, but the gravity holds back some galaxies, how is dark energy and then space, time, quantum gravity related? Um, <coughs> uh, dark energy, it's uh, quite confirmed in the sense that uh, uh, there have been some recent papers disputing the results, so it's not 100% sure. Uh, but the consensus is that uh, the universe uh, is actually accelerating, the spatial universe is actually accelerating. So up to mistake, which are possible, uh, we, have s we, we do see this phenomenon. And basically by dark energy we mean that, so there's this uh, accelerated expansion. Um, the... Uh, in the equation, in the basic equation of loop quantum gravity, uh, you need to take that into account, and you can take that into account, is, is, is possible. It's not something which is directly predicted of the theory, but in something that uh, comes into the theory, it comes it very naturally, and in fact, uh, it solves a technical problem inside the theory, which is called the infrared divergences. Uh, so it's compatible uh, with the theory. Um, in my opinion, uh, I've written some, I've written a nature paper on that. There is an overemphasis in this so called uh, dark energy problem. It's not such a mystery as people try to sell. Uh, I, I don't want to say that we have certainties about what dark energy is, uh, uh, but I want to say that we have a decent theory of what dark energy is. It's just classically a modification in. Uh, in Einstein equations, the cosmological constants, and quantum mechanically a modification of the quantum equation. More questions? It's still More? Yes, perfect. Uh, I wonder, can uh, loop quantum gravity say anything about the information paradox, black hole information? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, the information paradox uh, comes in a more than one variant, uh, but whatever variant you have, uh, if you buy this picture, if this picture is correct, uh, the information paradox disappears. The reason being that uh, there's information that falls into the black hole, but then the black hole, uh, the, the causal structure, it sort of tunnels so that it opens up, so information just comes out. The mystery came uh, if you believe the, you see, people, people didn't know what happened at the, uh, at the end of Fokker radiation. So they said, okay, at the end of Fokker radiation, it becomes smaller, 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 and then poop, it disappears. And where does the information inside go? It's lost. And then Hawking said, okay, so information is not conserved. And then other people said, ah, no, that's impossible. And there was this big, big debate. But once you try to study what actually happens at the end, you discover that it's not the black hole just pop into non-existence. It turns home into a white hole, which means that what is inside can come out. And then it's just like, you know, closing a box and the information seems to be disappeared. You open the box, information comes out. There's nothing mysterious about that. In, in different words, um, the horizon of the black hole is not an event horizon, technically. It doesn't go all the way to infinity. It, it, it looks like an event horizon for a while, but then it's, uh, it, it's only a trapping horizon or, 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 or a uh, apparent horizon. So there's no real loss of information that crosses the horizon. Information comes out. Uh, concerning white holes, is there any estimates about how frequent they should be in, say, our galaxy? Yeah, that's the question, <laughs> uh, to uh, go from this model to uh, actual um, uh, predictions. Uh, I, I have worked on the theory part. There are colleagues of mine who have worked on the, um, uh, on the phenomenological part. And that requires studying the cosmological evolution, what uh, it's, all, it's, all, it's all debated, uh, and I don't think there is anything uh, solid. Um, black holes, it's there are plenty. There are, uh, millions of black holes in our galaxy. Uh, 
more than millions. I, I don't I don't I don't know. I don't remember. But this is, is known. There's an estimate of how many black holes there are. Um, white holes it depend on this history and uh, on, on this story, on the on the plausibility of this story, and depend of early universe physics. And we don't know. There is a one hypothesis that black holes are a component of dark matter. So people are working on that also. May I sneak in a question at, uh, at the end? Uh, so, so my background is uh, the phenomenology of supersymmetry at the Large Hadron Collider. And as you're... I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> as you're well aware, we haven't found much super particles yet to, to discuss the phenomenology of. Um, but I suspect you're not as uh, upset by that as perhaps I am. Uh, no, I, I look, <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand why you're upset. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm happy. In fact, uh, a lot of people said, oh, we didn't find supersymmetry. It's a crisis in physics. I don't think it's a crisis in physics. It is a bit of a crisis of those who uh, believe this necessary to do the next step. Now, supersymmetry was obviously an extraordinarily good idea. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the argument supporting supersymmetry were uh, more than one, not just one, different, for, uh, you know them better than me, and uh, definitely solid, even for, for a non-believer in supersymmetry like me. Okay. Uh, but there were also co some contrary arguments, and uh, um, I think it came as a disappointment, a strong disappointment, that supersymmetry is not there at that scale, in that form. It might still be there at a higher scale, obviously, uh, we don't know, but it might be an indication that, uh, you know, the good Lord didn't do the world uh, this, the way we thought. It's not the first one. I grew up with um, proton decay, yeah. and some of my friends spent their life to look for proton decay. Proton decay, it's a spectacularly beautiful prediction of a spectacularly beautiful theory, which is SU5. Uh, Everybody said, okay, SU5 should be right, it's so beautiful, so coherent, so bring everything together, and it, uh, it uh, predicts that the proton is not stable, it decays in a certain amount of time, so big experiment will put, it was not as big a scale as supersymmetry, but it was quite a big story at the time, and proton just doesn't decay <laughs> in that time span. Uh, Huxley said, uh, wrote, uh, the, the tragedy of science is uh, when a beautiful idea is slain by the brute fact of nature. Yes. Well, I am afraid that that's one of the things. That, that may be <laughs> the fate of supersymmetry as well. Or not. Or maybe we'll be fine next round. So that's, you know, that's science. Yeah. That's also the beautiful science. We don't know. Time is uh, running, so I think we'll cut the questions there. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Carlo Rovelli again. And here's a small gift <laughs> from the research project. Thank you very much. Thank you.